My name is Katherine Kutchell. I'm the manager at the Special Collect Buncombe County Special Collections Library. For those of you who have maybe visit us, visited us pre-pandemic, we were the North Carolina room, um, but we've rebranded and let everybody know exactly how special we are in Special Collections. So um, if you've not visited us before, please come on by. Um, what's really special about Special Collections is that so many historic archives are in colleges and universities where you've got to make uh, arrangements. Um, at Duke, they won't even let you bring your own pencil. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of access issues in archives, and we're just so lucky to have an archives in a public library where you can come on down anytime that we're open and say, you know, I'd like to see the oldest thing that you've got in your collection, and I will say, absolutely, and run and go get it, um, and let you flip through a Bible from the 1620s. I just think that that is so cool. Um, we're really blessed to have the kind of collection that we have. Um, I want to shout out to my staff who are really awesome back here. So Kathy and Carissa and Jenny and the other, <laughs> and the other Catherine who is at a wedding today. Um, we're full of Catherines if you yeah. haven't learned that by now. Um, so uh, again, another person to thank, folks to thank. So we're doing this in partnership with North Carolina Historic Sites. So we have Lauren May and Caleb C. from uh, the Thomas Wolf and Dance Park Place here with us today. Um, and with special funding provided by the Friends of Buncombe County Special Collections, the Friends of the Thomas Wolf Memorial, and the Mountain History and Culture Group, which is a support group for the Vance Birthplace State Historic Site. So uh, today, we're really excited to welcome Dr. Darren Waters and Dr. Kevin Young. The way that we're gonna run this today is very much for any of you who have been to an academic conference. Um, I'm gonna introduce these folks. Dr. Waters is gonna speak for a few minutes. Dr. Young will speak for a few minutes, and then I'll come back up and help facilitate our discussion afterwards. Um, if you have folks who really wanted to come out today and weren't able to make it, we are filming this and it will be available on YouTube what, sometime next week, probably. So we'll share it out then and you can relive the experience and share it with your friends. Um, so without further ado, um, Dr. Darren Waters is the secretary, it's deputy secretary for archives and history, uh, the secretary of the North Carolina Historical Commission and the state historic preservation officer. Dr. Waters is from Asheville. We were really excited to find an oral history interview with his grandmother that he had not heard before and pass it along to him today. Very excited about that. Um, and he most recently before taking over at uh, the NCDCR. He was an associate professor of history at UNC Asheville, where he taught me everything I know, um, and uh, executive director of UNCA's Office of Community Engagement. Um, his dissertation, which some of you may be familiar with, is Life Beneath the Veneer, the Black Community in Asheville, North Carolina from 1793 to 1900 and it is, explores social, economic, and political development of the black community in Asheville during that time period. And let me tell you, I have worn out my digital copy over the last eight months. Um, it has been very useful. Um, so, and then we have Dr. Kevin Young with us today. Dr. Young is an English professor at Appalachian State University. Um, he has a background in philosophy, English, and history, so I'm really excited to see uh, where his perspective comes from today. Dr. Young's dissertation, an upcoming book from UNC Press, is The World of Broadus Miller, Homicide, Lynching, and Outlawry in Early 20th Century North Carolina, um, and it's set um, it is about an African-American man named Bryce Miller who was accused of killing a 15-year-old white mill worker in Morganton. Um, his work examines a number of interrelated topics in race relations and criminal justice during the early 20th century. And the book, uh, The Violent World of Broadus Miller, will be published by the University of North Carolina Press in April. So we'll probably have Dr. Young back when the book comes out and he can talk a little bit more about that. So thank you all very much again for being here and Dr. Waters. <laughs> Thank you all. Good to see you all. And Catherine, thank you for that kind introduction. And let me just say about Catherine, um, there's students who are just the bright stars out there. So Catherine is one of those. It's interesting that the students that I had who I still see as those bright stars, there are no guys in there. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I get to work with, you know, Catherine, and Catherine serves on one of our uh, friend support groups for uh, the State Archives, so I see her quite often. And then I get to see another one of my really, really uh, strong and those bright stars of a student, Liz Menendez, who is at our site at Charlotte Hawkins Brown. So I see her all the time and she's there, you know, just really moving things. And I said, I'm not surprised. These are the students who were just those bright stars when I was teaching in the classroom. And I'll say about, about Catherine as well. Catherine was one of those students that, um, while she may say that I taught her everything she knows, she taught me a lot. She's one of those students who make you nervous <laughs> because at a certain point in time, you're going to walk into the classroom and they're going to know more than you know. Um, that's Catherine. Yeah. So when I walked into the classroom and Catherine was there for a while, I had to make sure that I was kind of on point <laughs> with what I was going to say because she knew more than I did. Mm -hmm. um, it's good to be here with you all. Um, you know, uh, I've been kind of trying to apologize for not being in touch with some of my closest friends like Deborah Miles and haven't talked with uh, with Dee in, in a while. Um, this job that I have now keeps me more busy than I ever would have known. Um, but it is a fun job. I have a great team of people that I get to work with. Lauren out at Vance, Kayla here at the Thomas Wolf site, which are uh, two of our 27 state historic sites across the state of North Carolina. About to add a new one, um, the Thomas Day site um, in Milton. Uh, North Carolina up in Caswell County. So that is coming at the end of this month when we will officially bring the Thomas Day site into the state um, division of state historic sites. My job also has to be overseeing our museum division. I, you know, if, if Secretary Wilson were here, or if he were watching me now, he would tell me not to forget to say that D DNCR is the department that does the fun things for North Carolina. We take care of the things that everyone loves about the state. And he would say from A to Z, from the arts to the zoo. I have tried to get him to switch the word archive first because it comes in the alphabet before arts. Um, he hasn't done that yet. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a fun job because we're doing history in some form or fashion every day. Now, um, Thomas Wolfe, let me just jump to that. Catherine said we had a few minutes. In my book, a few minutes is like three minutes few, just a few, a handful, but she said 20 minutes. Now it's hard to try to fit this even into 20 minutes. I don't know what Kevin is gonna say. I'm sure that he's gonna show me up. He's more of an expert on this than I am. My, uh, my engagement, I guess, with Thomas Wolfe has really been driven by curiosity. Um, that curiosity got started when I was writing my own dissertation about the African-American community here. And it's interesting to read Wolfe's work because while he fictionalizes most of everything in his work in Look Homeward Angel and other um, uh, books that he has written, his play as well, the one place that he always identifies as in reality as it is, is the YMI, the Young Men's Institute. When he talks about that community, it's very interesting that he does that, specifically identifies it as the Young Men's Institute. So as I'm writing my dissertation, I decided to uh, incorporate, if I could, Wolf into the dissertation. And I did this by talking in the last chapter of the dissertation, which I have here. You can see, Catherine can see, I've, I've been going back and forth through the dissertation as well, trying to get a book manuscript written on this thing, but that's been a challenge to try to do, especially in my current role. But, um, the last chapter of the dissertation is called Barely Seen, Rarely Heard. And it looks at the politics of the period that I cover in the dissertation, beginning from the period of slavery all the way up to 1900. The bulk of it deals with the post-Civil War period. I tried to avoid Civil War stuff as much as I possibly could, um, but then got drug into that by my former colleague, um, Dan Pierce, at the university. And it became probably the, the most rewarding class that I taught on the Civil War and Reconstruction. Just totally enjoyed teaching that class and never would have expected that I would. But Wolf, um, if you read the last chapter of my dissertation, it looks at how the African-American community here in Asheville 
while there was an effort to try to be engaged in the politics of the city, that many of the city leaders just ignored the community, especially the main community, the East End community where the YMI is located. So over time, this community would become, as Wolf describes it in his work, and in fact, I'm just gonna to go to this page in my dissertation of where I ended up using Wolf, was looking at the fact that the city council, um, the board of aldermen, would hear what African Americans were saying the needs of their community were, but then would table it and never come back to it. No resources were being put into this community. So Wolf, when he writes about this in Look Homer Angel, about that community, this is what he said. This is what I said, and then I, I will reference his work in here of how he describes the community. Based on these continuous complaints, the condition of the city's most central black community appears to have been in the process of developing the conditions that Thomas Wolfe later described in his autobiographical novel, Look Homeward Angel. Wolfe recalled that his mother had often, often asked him to go into that neighborhood to find servants to work in her boarding house and stated that his incursions into what he always called, and I know many of you know what he referred to this as, as nigger town, mm. required him to enter a city of rickets where he was obliged to poke into their fetid shacks, and this is quoting from Look Home Rachel, into their fetid shacks, past the slow stench of little rills of mire and sewage, and fetid cellars through all the rank labyrinth of the hill sprawling settlement, end quote. Although Wolf's assessment of the conditions of what was really one of Asheville's scattered black communities was colored by his, and at the time, this is what I wrote, his culturally racist views, the community, as the minutes of the city's board of aldermen meetings <coughs> suggest, was often neglected by the city's leaders. Consequently, the conditions that Wolf remembered from his youth in the 1920s did not develop overnight. Instead, the conditions were the result of an extended period of ignoring the community's needs. So, when I defended the dissertation, one member of my dissertation committee, who I won't name him uh, here for fear that we might want to attack him, <laughs> and I hear that he's always getting himself in trouble often, but great historian, great historian. He said to me after defending, after my defense, he said, Darren, that was a brilliant use and a really good use of Wolf. But you know, no one reads Wolf anymore. <laughs> and I was like, somehow I was offended by that, right? <laughs> Being from Asheville, you know, it's, it's kind of that saying, you know, in, in a relationship, you can talk about your parents and your family. I can talk about my parents and my family, but you don't talk about my family. And I won't talk about your family. Yeah. Right. So this kind of identity thing kicked in. I was deeply offended by that. You know, it's like no one reads Wolf. So I just became even more curious about Wolf, and I was pulled deeper into this. I would say, uh, when I guess Catherine, I can't even remember. It's been so many years. I I, I live in denial every day. My my oldest son. I was just telling Dee. My oldest son is now married and living in Florida, and I have another son who's now just about 25 years old, and I'm thinking, I cannot be this age. <laughs> so, but then I look at when, when some of these events that I have uh, participated in have occurred, and I look at the date, and I'm like, just like, oh my God, time is just really passing by. But I can't remember when Buckham County Library and uh, did sponsored an event on Thomas Wolfe at the YMI to talk about his short story, The Child by Tiger. And I participated in that with Joanne Modlin, um, who is a wolf expert. And my job in that was to really talk about the Will Harris story, which you know I wrote about in my dissertation and a little bit about that in the dissertation. And the response to that was really interesting. So I got pulled deeper into this look at Thomas Wolfe. And he still really fascinates me. And he's brilliant at actually capturing people in character. I mean, he's very detailed. People talk about that he's wordy, but I find the wordiness actually kind of refreshing because he really describes people in a way that I think just really gets at the heart of the reality of a few human beings' work. 
But that pulled me deeper in, and, and um, Kevin's dissertation advisor, who's one of my intellectual heroes as well, uh, Dr. John Enscombe, who was one of the first people to write about black life in Western North Carolina. I mean, I had to really push hard to get my dissertation committee, with the exception of John Hope Franklin, who was on that committee, to get them to agree to let me do the study on the black community in Asheville and Western North Carolina. They did not think that I would find the resources to do the study. That's what it was. John Hope Franklin was the only person saying, let him do what he wants to do. And nobody was going to challenge John Hope Franklin. <laughs> so, so, you know, have at it. What made the work really move was because of uh, Biltmore, developing a relationship with Biltmore State. Biltmore opened their ar archives and there were just a plethora of information that just poured out of that. But I told, um, people have heard this before and I'll say this, I love Asheville, I love my hometown. I have a very large family. We celebrated my dad's 82nd uh, birthday yesterday. He is the oldest of 10. I am one of what I think 32 grandchildren of that side of the family. There's hardly anywhere you can go here in Asheville and people do not know who you are. So when I left in 1985, I had no intentions of coming back to live. I'd come back to visit family and do all of that. But then imagine my surprise because I write this dissertation, I get pulled back to Asheville. I see Anita is sitting back there. Anita, I could tell stories about my first interactions with Anita when I came back. And, you know, Anita, I've never forgotten that you put me in a room with John Hope Franklin's poster staring right over me, <laughs> saying, you know, remember, this is the guy that you've got to answer to. Um, but anyway, I had no intentions of coming back to live. I, I kind of resisted even the offer to open up a tenure track position at UNC Asheville for me to uh, track like that. I want to go back to the triangle. I wanted to be close to where the boys were. You know, just, that it, it is what it is. But I came back, and it turned out to be a very rewarding experience. But what I'll say is I told people, I said, that I know my dissertation was going to bring me back to Asheville to live. I would have written a different dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> But it is what it is, and it worked out really good because, you know, it, it allowed, I think that everyone should have the opportunity to live in their hometown as an adult. Mm -hmm. you, you experience the place in a very different way, and I had that opportunity to do that. But John Insko and I started getting into this back and forth because after I engaged the story of the child by Tiger, I was just like, Wolf is just a fascinating figure to me, and what was happening to him over time. Because my argument about wolf and race is that, and this is the human experience, the argument I would make. I mean, if history does anything for us, it should teach us to empathize. Right? It should enhance our ability to empathize with people. I don't know that it always does that, but it does. I have been haunted for a long time by the words of Winthrop Jordan in his mammoth book, which all of us who went through these PhDs had to engage Wolf's, uh, Jordan's work, White Over Black, of what he says in the introduction of that book, when he's writing it in the 1960s, while the civil rights movement is in full swing. But he said, you know, the challenge for the historian is to be able to step back and to read history forward, not backwards. That's a major challenge, think about it. Because what you've got to try to do is to put yourself in the feet of the actors of that time and look forward and think about it. We know what happens because we have the ability to kind of look back and see all of the ramifications of decisions that were made. They don't necessarily have that, the benefit of that, um, when you're moving through the process, right? When you're living in real time. So the challenge with a historian is to be able to do that. Catherine knows I would make this argument all the time. Try to step back, read history forward, don't read it backwards. So Wolf, I have tried to do that with Wolf. And I firmly believe that Wolf over time had he lived, I would believe that he would probably have fallen in the category of a Robert Penn Warren. I think that he would have become another Robert Penn Warren, someone who bravely, Robert Penn Warren, who I say bravely dealt with the issues of race even in his own heritage. I mean, he was the grandson, I think the grandson of a Confederate veteran. If you read his small essay, his small book, 
uh, legacies, uh, the legacy of the Civil War. It is his, it's a cathartic exercise, I think, for Penn Warren, because he's trying to deal and to reckon with that heritage. I highly recommend it. I believe that Wolf was in the same place. And I think that The Child by Tiger somewhat demonstrates that. Uh, issue an effort to try to begin to work things out. I just recently, I uh, was invited up, I guess a couple of years ago by my good friend, Terry Roberts. And Terry asked me to come up and to welcome the Thomas Wolfe Society here. He said, we'd like for you to do the welcome for that. I thought, well, that would mean going in and just maybe saying, oh, welcome to our city, right? <laughs> and then leaving. <laughs> he told me, no, you've got about 30 minutes. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to be in a room with a bunch of Thomas Wolfe experts. This is, makes me very uncomfortable. It's extremely intimidating, which probably many of you are too. So I still feel that sense of intimidation. Um, but I ended up talking in that speech about, um, in that brief talk, and I'm burning up time here, Catherine, I know. Um, <laughs> to make a couple of points about, about him. What I feel that we have a responsibility to do is to, if we can, as human beings, if we are able to empathize, to give people the space to grow, right? If they can open their minds right, and engage new ideas, then you may see a person change over time on some of write in the dissertation that these, is, these are his culturally racist views. But I think that if you read uh, even of Time and a River, you read that book, you see a changing wolf, especially when you get to the end of it. And I'm still trying to work through the end of Time and a River when he tells you, I have a thing to tell you, to really understand it. But I would highly recommend, if you have not read it, to just sit a while with that. What was going on with Wolf as he's working through it? I have up here uh, another book. I hope I'm making sense of what I'm saying, these reflections, and I'll sit down in a few minutes to hear Kim. But uh, Joel Williamson's book, um, The Crucible of Race, um, Black White Relations in the American South Since Emancipation. Dan Pierce used to say this, this was my Bible, because I had it everywhere I went. Um, it's been replaced now by probably uh, Alexis de Tocqueville's democracy. <laughs> I talk about Alexis de Tocqueville all the time. But this is an interesting book because one of the things that Williamson did in this book, he looks at um, where people are. He looks at higher education. And he looks at schools like Clemson and North Carolina State as these schools where you still getting you getting people because they, they're focused more on engineering, science, and those things, not the humanities. These larger things, where people still are coming from those institutions who have more of a rigid attitude about racial issues, but people who were at institutions like a UNC Chapel Hill, which is committed to the study of humanities and, and those those areas of, of study, UVA that you were getting a different group of people who were coming out of those spaces. While they may have still harbored some racist ideas, they were open to at least considering it and thinking it through. It's not surprising to me that Wolf would be one of those people that I now see moving in that direction, given the fact that he was a graduate of Chapel Hill. He comes out of that space. This was a real thinking man who's thinking it through. And his experiences, I think, internationally, we're definitely going to challenge his attitudes about things. I think the boldness of the fact that he was willing to do that, and, and I'm taking this from my very last conversation with John Franklin, had this amazing conversation with Dr. Franklin about three months before he died, where I went up to his house and I just sat there and I just unloaded on him about what was going on in my own mind. Because I was very rigid on some of the things that I thought and I had learned over time. But going through the master's degree and then the PhD, especially at institutions like UNC Chapel Hill, there was this anxiety that it created because all of these new ideas were getting introduced that you had to consider. 
And so it started changing the way that I saw certain things that I was very rigid about. And Dr. Franklin actually said to me, when I left his house that day, we had a three hour conversation. And it was rare because I normally went to his house. I took my sons to serve as buffers between me and him because he intimidated me to death. And he would pay more attention to Jonathan O. Lewis than he did me. He was, he, he would probably hate hearing if he was still with us hearing that I was intimidated by his birth. It, it was just John Hope Franklin. It was just who he was, right? So intimidating to be around him. But that last conversation, it was just me unloading. And he sat there. And as I left his house that day, he said, there are, he said, I want to applaud your courage for taking a journey that you have to take. And I believe Wolf was on this, uh, that type of a journey as well. And the Child by Tiger, to me, is a demonstration of that. Um, I, you know, when I prepare to give talks, I'll sit down here in a second. I go through material, and I'm thinking what I remember when you, know, you were learning to do public speaking you were thinking, I don't have anything to say. I'm now at the place now when you've read so much, it's like, okay, I can't get everything into you know just 20 or 30 minutes because there's too much to say. I could probably stay up here with you for the rest of the day just talking about Wolf and what is happening in the story like the Child by Tiger. I mean, he had been thinking about this for a while. We know the Child by Tiger is based on the real events that happened here in Asheville um, with the Will Harris episode when Joanne and I did this uh, this together years ago. My job was to talk about Will Harris. Who was Will Harris and what happened? It was interesting to, to do it in the context of Williamson's book because there had been other incidents that had happened that were similar to what happened with Will Harris. Robert Charles in New Orleans, 1900. If you read what happens to Robert Charles in New Orleans in 1900, it is so strikingly similar to what happened here, you would be like, was it just a complete repeat? Did they follow the story of Robert Charles, who Joel Williamson describes here probably as the first black nationalist in New Orleans? And he is slaughtered, he is killed. And the interesting thing about reading that is that there is a reaction, not just in New Orleans, to what happens to Robert Charles. There's a reaction in other parts of the country. In Chicago, a black man is found in the middle of the street just screaming at the top of his lungs because he thinks that he's going to be killed by white people the same way Robert Charles was in New Orleans. There were incidents of reactions to Robert Charles' murder and essentially lynching in 1900 in New Orleans, just as, they were in, as far away as Detroit. It's ironic to think in 1906, and what, Wolf is six years old, when this incident happens here in Asheville, Will Harris, the, the murders, five people I think murdered in, in that incident. The Wolf is six years old, this was deeply imprinted on his mind and he remembered it. So even after he wrote Look Homeward Angel, he's over in Switzerland, he writes back to um, Max Perkins and he basically says, I'm thinking about my new book. I wrote this up for the introduction to my book manuscript recently, trying to tell the story about how he tells his Max Perkins, I want to write the story. I have a chapter in this book um, that I'm thinking about, a follow-up to Look Homeward Angel, that will be called The Congo. And it will tell the story of, an, of a black man who goes crazy and goes berserk and then kills kills a number of people in the city. It, it's, based, it's taken straight from what happens in 1906, and he wants to write about it. He ends up not writing it. You can find the letter, the exchange, and he goes through how he wants to tell the story, why he wants to tell the story. But it's just amazing that it had la that lasting impression on him. If you go back to the Will Harris episode in 1906, it's interesting to think that just four months before Will Harris went on a killing spree here in Asheville, you had had the Atlanta race riots. So to what degree was what happened here with Will Harris somewhat connected to that, right? I don't know if it was, but that was something that we tried to explore, a reaction of what is happening to black men, of what is happening to black people during this period. It's just interesting to think about, to throw it out there. Now, and this is the last thing I'll say, Child by Tiger 
is a fictionalized version of this real thing that happens here in Asheville in 1906. And what is amazing about what Wolf does is that he takes this Will Harris, the person who is described in the newspaper accounts here, as the desperado. Even to the point that the African American community in Asheville gets together, meets in a joint meeting, and they pass a resolution that they send to the city that ends with them saying, we repudiate Will Harris as a member of our race. It was at that point when I wrote that up for the dissertation that my dissertation advisor, Harry Watson, said, you've got to explain that. What's going on? They're, they're essentially condoning what happened to Will Harris and this is essentially a lynching. And he said, you need to explain that. And you explain it in the context of all of this, they probably were trying to protect him. If you read his news stories, read the news stories on Will Harris, you will see they talk about how when they brought Will Harris's body back into Asheville, that there were no African-Americans on the street. They were all kind of hiding in their windows, looking out. So I'm sure they knew what had happened just a few months before in Atlanta. And there was some fear that the same thing could happen here, given this episode. But they meet in this mass meeting and said, we repudiate this man, and they just go down the line and just really berate him as he's not a member of our race. The news stories are talking, trying to explain why he did what he did. Some say, well, he went crazy. He was on cocaine. He was this. Same things they said about Robert Charles in New Orleans in 1900 to explain these things. But Wolf creates a sympathetic figure in The Child by Tiger. He's not this hardcore desperado. This is a sympathetic, and that's saying something, something about what is going on in Wolf's head at the time. And then I found out by reading further in another, uh, another scholar on uh, Wolf, I can't remember his name, but he says that it's not lost on him that when Wolf wrote The Child by Tiger as a short story, that he was reading Black Thunder, which is the story of Gabriel Prosser's rebellion in Virginia. One of the books that comes out of the Harlem Renaissance writers, he's reading, he's reading broadly. He's doing what some people don't do, they don't read, and they don't read outside of what they want to read, what they agree with, and nothing else, right? You don't wanna challenge, but Wolf is reading outside of this. And interestingly, he takes Will Harris and he names him Dick Prosser borrows the Prosser name right, from Gable Prosser's rebellion. So it raises the question, what is going on in Wolf's mind? What is happening as he moves across time? I'm gonna stop, but make one comparison. One of my favorite heroes, historical hero, figures now, uh, a hero is um, Hugo Black, former Supreme Court Justice, who, if anybody knows the story of Hugo Black, he becomes probably the most liberal member of the court, right? He's the one who is saying these Bill of Rights need to be applied broadly. And he's making that argument. I mean, you can watch, uh, uh, this is a documentary film on him and to see his passion about that. It's really Hugo Black who helps to guide the Brown decision through the court. Because when Earl Warren comes on the court at the time, he's new. Hugo had been there for a while, nominated to the court by uh, Franklin Roosevelt. If you recall, there was some question as to whether or not he would be confirmed as a Supreme Court Justice. Up until the time that he went on radio to explain some things that were in his past, up until that time, the most listened to radio broadcast in the world had been the abdication of Edward VIII from when he abdicated the throne. When, when Hugo Black went on radio to explain, after being nominated for the court, to explain why it was that he had been a member of the Ku Klux Klan in Alabama, it became the most listened to radio broadcast. Everybody listened to see what he was gonna have to say. I just asked, you know, recommend listen, watching the documentary. He explained it, he made the point that Living in Alabama at the time, if you were gonna move politically, there was no way you were gonna be able to do that unless you were a member of the Klan. But he's kind of this stealth figure to the point that he, that he then becomes the Supreme Court Justice. He's pushing rights across, broadening the expansion of what we know as our rights as citizens of this country to the point that 
Alabama has still not rescinded its decision to ban the return of his remain, remains to the state of Alabama. <laughs> I bring up Hugo Black just to say that people can change. Right? People can make a move, and I firmly believe, and maybe we'll answer questions, it would give an opportunity to delve into that a little bit further. I think that uh, Wolf was one of those people. Um, I'm just going to end with a quote that he gives um, about America, I think, in Time of the River. And it's just a beautiful quote where he talks about America, and he says this. America, it is a fabulous country, the only fabulous country. It is the only place where miracles not only happen, but where they happen all the time. And those miracles might be people moving over time as they engage, engage different ideas. And I believe for me, and I may be wrong about this, as I said, I am no expert on Thomas Wolfe, but that may have been the case with Thomas Wolfe. And I think it was, it would be at least the argument that I would make. Thank you. Good time to go get a cookie, refill your coffee. Okay, folks, I think we got our tech issues all sorted out. We got our uh, uh, PowerPoint up, so we'll turn it over to Dr. Young. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'm in a difficult position. I don't know how I could possibly follow what I was just being said. I think uh, someone has proved that Wolf, in some respects, is wrong. You can go home again. <laughs> it's only a question of how long you want to stay there. <laughs> but, uh, that, that was a phenomenal presentation. And I just wish I had a small percentage of the eloquence that was displayed. But it's talking about Thomas Wolfe, then I too am very interested in the Will Harris case and Wolfe's short story, The Child by Tiger. Um, 1937 short story about Will Harris. But who is or who was the real, quote unquote, real Will Harris. Will Harris, in October 1901, Will Harris had escaped from a Mecklenburg County chain gang, uh, to which he had been sentenced for arson. Uh, over the next 18 months, Harris allegedly committed barn burnings, burglaries, and assaults throughout Mecklenburg County. In April 1903, he was arrested in Baltimore, Maryland, and brought back to Charlotte to stand trial. He pled guilty to nine counts of robbery and assault with a deadly weapon, and was sentenced to 25 years in the state penitentiary. Then in August 1903, uh, Harris had escaped from prison and returned to Mecklenburg County, where he shot the husband of his former girlfriend. Um, and he was outlawed. So what does it mean that Harris was outlawed? Well, the outlawed, to be outlawed, meant that a person was utterly stripped of legal protections and could legally be shot on site by any North Carolina citizen. This was following an 1866 North Carolina statute, the Outlawry Statute, that had its origins in fugitive slave law. It would remain in effect and be used up until the 1970s. Um, stripped of all legal protections, based on fugitive slave law, could be used against wanted individuals of any race who had been charged with a felony. 
any two justices of the peace or any superior or supreme court judge could issue an outlawry proclamation and it gave every North Carolina citizen the right to arrest the fugitive if the fugitive was called upon to surrender and then attempted to flee or resist arrest, then every North Carolina citizen had the legal right to kill them. Without a trial, without having been convicted, but he could still legally be killed. This is Will Harris, Mecklenburg County outlaw. After being outlawed, Will Harris from Charlotte became a legendary figure. Um, for months after being outlawed, Harris would be blamed for various unsolved crimes and suspicious fires in Mecklenburg County, but he was never caught. The outlawed Harris became a, a legendary bad man, quote unquote. Something in the same tradition as a famous Staggerly or Stackerly or however you wish to spell or pronounce his name. Um, there are so many versions of Staggerly, John Hardy, Railroad Bill, these legendary figures who live outside of the law. And this was Will Harris, a famous man, a man who had become legendary. But the real individual behind the myth was elusive. November 1906, Will Harris. Um, Will Harris shows up in November in Asheville for at least someone who calls himself Will Harris. When Harris was outlawed, an outlawry proclamation was issued for him that described him as being a certain person, a colored man, calling himself and supposed to be Will Harris. The truth is no one knows who this man was, that he could have been the Will Harris who had gained fame in Charlotte. But the fact that the individual himself in Asheville so openly boasted, I am Will Harris, indicates how, what degree of fame Will Harris had gained, that Will Harris had become a legendary figure. And the fact that he is described in the outlawry proclamation as calling himself and supposed to be Will Harris just shows the degree of uncertainty about who this man actually was. But what is interesting about the Alawari Proclamation is that not only the way, uh, is it the way that Will Harris was described, but the way that his victims are described as well. Will Harris did kill and murder Charles R. Blackstock, J.W. Bailey, Ben Addison, Jack Corpening, and Tom Mill, citizens and residents of the said county and state. What I find fascinating about this listing of victims is there is no differentiation between white and black victims, which if you have looked at early 20th century newspaper accounts, invariably they will be differentiated. But in this one instance, there's a type of equality in death that Will Harris's victims, black and white, are listed together communally without distinguishing between them. Now, these were the two white police officers that uh, were killed in Will Harris's shooting rampage, Charles Blackstock and James Bailey. Blackstock is buried in a family cemetery in the community of Jupiter. James Bailey is buried in Riverside Cemetery. But what about the three black victims of Will Harris? Well, the Ben Harrison, Benjamin Franklin Harrison, he's also buried in Riverside Cemetery with the uh, inscription on his tombstone saying, killed by a desperado. A desperado <laughs> is listed as the person who, who had killed Mr. Addison. And Benjamin 
Jackson and kept a small grocery store on Eagle Street. And in the words of the Citizen Times, he was known as a worthy, respectable man living in a peaceable manner. He was shot inside, just inside the grocery store. And there is phenomenal online research uh, that an article that Thomas Wolfe Memorial had put on the Medium website that traces in detail the personal history of Ben Addison, which is really amazing. Uh, born in Fredericksburg, Virginia, had enlisted in the Civil War in the closing months, had mustered out of service in Jacksonville, Florida in 1866, had lived in Boston and then in South Carolina, First shows up in Asheville in 1892, marrying Catherine at Haywood, and he and his wife purchased several lots in the neighborhood that would come to be known as the block, and operated a number of restaurants and stores. So they are very, very, I would say very much an upper middle class family within the time period. Um, but what about the others? Jack's Corpenter. Well, the name Corpening is interesting because you can tell a lot simply from the name. In fact, in Wolf Welcome to Our City in the opening scene, and it's a really odd, she only appears the one time that she's mentioned Miss Effie Corpening because that surname is very common among African Americans in the early 20th century in Western North Carolina. So I think it is probably a safe supposition to uh, believe that Jack's Corbin was a North Carolina native. But very little is known about him. Um, Bob Terrell, in his book on the Will Howard Harris killing, had actually mentioned that, uh, given him the name, I think Walter Corbin, that he was Walter Jacko Corbin. What about the next victim of Will Harris uh, within the black community? Tom Neal. The 1900 census listing for Mr. Neal in Asheville. And the census listing, it shows him living on Velvet Street, which actually connected the Eagle and Beaumont Streets um, until urban renewal eliminated the street, I think, in 1979. You can also see from the census listing um, that. Mr. Neal was a North Carolina native. He was born in 1874, so he would have been around 32 years old at the time he was killed. And he was boarding on Velvet Street, worked as a waiter, could read but could not write. Three of the five people Will Harris killed were black. And as Darren had mentioned, there was the large community meeting in the aftermath adopting resolutions denouncing the crimes of this alleged Will Harris, who had proven at such awful cost to others his utter unworthiness of human life, which is rather severe. And notice again, though, he's labeled the alleged Will Harris. After his death, there were so many stories about who this man actually was, so much speculation. Uh, some said that they had known him in Virginia. Some said they had known him in South Carolina. It's like he appeared from nowhere and he comes has, from a mysterious background. So was the man in Asheville really Will Harris? That's the name that is assigned to it, but who knows? Um, what about the character of Dick Prosser in The Child by Tiger? He was deeply religious and went to church three times a week. He read his Bible every night. It is amazing what a sympathetic character Thomas Wolfe has made Dick Crosser into. Uh, if you talk about Wolfe's intention with this short story, he is obviously making a sympathetic character out of the protagonist. Wolf, later in the short story, um, has a description of Dick Prosser as coming from a mysterious background. But when he's first introduced, there are certain clues about Mr. Prosser. 
The Child by Tiger opened in late October, and Dick Prosser is described as having arrived looking for work just a month or two before. In contrast to the alleged Will Harris, who apparently showed up in Asheville the day before the shootings actually occurred. Um, so that it means that Dick Prosser would have arrived around August of 1906. He's described as having been a member of a regiment of crack Negro troops upon the Texas border, and that the stamp of the military man was evident in everything he did. He had, he said, only recently received his discharge from the army. And in his own words, he's an old army man, you know, if they take his rifle away for him, from him, by, that's just like taking candy from a little baby. So, all of these clues about his background, I think from any, for anyone in the early 20th century, they would have suggested immediately the 25th Infantry Regiment, which had been stationed in Texas along the border in 1906 and becomes quite famous for other reasons. Um, the 25th Infantry Regiment was a renowned, distinguished military unit. They had served in the, in the West. I think the picture is taken in Montana in the 1890s. They had then served in the Philippines, had distinguished backgrounds. But they're most known for the Browns Middle Affair, which is what happened in August 1906 two months before the October 1906. July 28, 1906, the uh, 25th U.S. Infantry, they arrived in Brownsville, Texas. From the onset, they experienced hostility from the local white residents. Um, the white population of Brownsville did not welcome this black military unit coming into town. And on August 12th, 1906, a white woman in Brownsville was allegedly attacked, and the troops, the entire regiment, was placed on uh, uh, base, you were confined to base, curfew was issued in town, and then uh, the following night, no one is clear what happened. There was gunfire in the town, which, who was firing? circumstances, no one knows, it was dark, there were a few people involved, gunfire, and a white bartender was killed and a policeman was injured. What happens in the aftermath? Hmm. President Theodore Roosevelt orders the dishonorable discharge of the entire regiment, 167 men. Uh, this placard from the time period, you can see what an effect it had. Because in the South, African Americans had been essentially disfranchised, but in northern states, the African American vote was important for politicians. And the black community felt that Roosevelt had thrown them under the bus. Yeah. Um, because he had promised the square deal every time to everyone, and then he said, I don't care how long and honorable any of your records are, you're all discharged, get out. Now this received enormous publicity. Um, Harper's Weekly, front cover of Harper's Weekly. Hmm. You can see the veteran with the title underneath, dishonorably discharged. But look at the medals, look how distinguished soldier is. Several men in the 25th Infantry had served long careers in the military and were highly decorated, including six Medal of Honor recipients. All of them indiscriminately were dishonorably discharged, every man in the regiment. Why is this so significant, the dishonorable discharge? Is they were no longer eligible for any military pension for the decades they had spent in service. Um, there was ultimately a review and 
about a dozen soldiers were reinstated, but the vast majority of the regiment were out of luck. They, in the early 1970s, in the Nixon administration, there was a review that dishonorable discharges were rescinded. Of course, this is, what, nearly seven decades after the fact? There was one surviving member of the regiment, and he ultimately got to receive his pension when he was in his 80s. But all the rest, no. So, Wolf's description of Dick Prosser. He had been a member of a regiment of crack Negro troops upon the Texas border and the staff of the military man was up in everything he did. He'd only been recently discharged from the army. If they take his white rifle away from him, that's like taking candy from a baby. I think it's clear what Wolf is connotating in the images that he's drawn up for any early 20th century reader. And what he's done with Dick Prosser is he has made Dick Prosser into a sympathetic figure, someone who has been terribly wrong. And then he talks about the display of the dead outlaw's corpse. When the alleged Will Harris was brought back into town and displayed in the undertaker's front window in downtown Nashville, and approximately 2,000 people came to view the dead body. Well, it was in this way, bullet riddled, shot to pieces, open to the vengeful and morbid gaze of all that Dick came back to town. The mob came back right to its starting point. They took that ghastly mutilated thing, the corpse, and hung it in the window of the undertaker's place for every woman, man, and child in town to see. I think it has always been the same with people. They protest, they shudder, they say they want to won't go. They're too refined. They're too civilized. But in the end, they always have their look. Uh, if you, what is amazing about this story is that the most disgust, the most outrage that Wolf shows in the story is ultimately toward the mob at the end of the story and a display of the dead black man's corpse. Um, and he talks about how Something had come into he, the narrator, who was a young boy at the time, how it had come into their life, um, he and his childhood friends. Something had come into life, into our lives, that he had never known about before. It was kind of a shadow, a poisonous presence. Um, moving forward for a bit. Well, I'll tell you what, because I will, I'll be honest with you. Um, this PowerPoint presentation, somehow in the technical aspects of it, there's some super glitch that has happened and all the slides are disorganized. <laughs> um, but what Wolf is doing in The Child by Tiger is amazing to me. Because instead of dealing with what would have been the easiest fictionalization process of the story, which is to emphasize the bad man, to emphasize Will Harris as a villainous figure, he makes Will Harris into someone who is a sympathetic figure. And instead of showing outrage at the killings, the shootings in Asheville, I mean, he describes the shootings, but he's very matter of fact about what is happening. But his outrage is saved for the members of the mob and his, um, portrayal of Will Harris's background with these clear connotations, these clear hints about somebody who has been terribly wronged, coming from a military background, um, is really thoughtful. And I think it indicates that Darren is absolutely right about Wolf's progression, racially speaking, and about his attitudes. <clears throat> I will leave it there. Thank you. One more round of applause and thank you for <laughs> Y'all gave me a lot to think about. Uh, so
again, thank you so much. Um, that gives us all a lot to think about, I'm sure. And I, um, I will admit that I read Child by Tiger for the very first time this morning. Um, <laughs> I had, um, I actually, the, the talk that you were talk, you were speaking about, Darren, it was, um, it was right as you had started back at UNC Asheville because I went to it as a cultural event. Yep. <laughs> and wrote a paper about this. So it was a little, a little over 10 years ago. Um, so, it, you know, that was my first encounter with it. And of course, I've heard quite a bit about the uh, Will Harris murders. And um, you were talking about your Civil War class. And I'm thinking about the Wolf quote that I really love, despite not ever having made it all the way through Look Homeward Angel is, um, it's in the preface. And he says, fiction is not fact, but fiction is fact rearranged and charged with a purpose. Um, and so it made me think about that Civil War class because I love the way that you taught it and trying to teach it to think forward was, we would watch an episode of Ken Burns' The Civil War once a week and then we'd have to write a paper and tell him how bad it was. <laughs> um, it, 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 as, as someone who was a, you know, a hardcore like Civil War buff and like one of the reasons that I got so excited about doing history was Ken Burns' Civil War, but then to have it put back in front of me as like through it, going through it through a critical lens and uh, that's just really stuck with me this for, for years, for a decade now, I, I think about how can I reframe this? What is the person really talking about? What about this is fiction? What about this is uh, collective memory? And what about this is actual history and truth? And so one of the questions I wanted to ask you all was um, in thinking about Welcome to Our City, and which is, which is first published in 1922, and then um, Child by Tiger, which is several years later, over 10 years later in 1937, and seeing this kind of growth that Wolf has, but also this, um, at least for Child by Tiger, thinking about, you know, Wolf never saw exactly this incident, um, but leading up to the Will Harris event, is of course the incident in Charleston, but then there are three racial terror lynchings in Buncombe County that we know about that have been confirmed that happened in the years leading up to Wolf um, being born in 1900. And so in Child by Tiger in particular, uh, this is the last couple of paragraphs that I might be reading too much into them, maybe not, I'm not sure. But he says, but all these stories came to nothing. Nothing was ever proved. Men debated and discussed these things a thousand times, who and what he had been, what he had done, where he had come from, and all of it came to nothing. No one knew the answer, but I think that I found the answer. I think that I know from where he came. And so just thinking about that particular quote and collective memory and the way that like Wolf writes about racial terror violence in Asheville, just love to have you reflect on that. Oh yeah, you might have to click it on. You have to slide it up. Is it working? It's working. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. You gave us a hard one. <laughs> well, you, you, you let them know. I, I got some of the hard questions. Um, oh. Repeat that again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's kind of rambling thought for me, but I, but I was saying at the very end of, of Child by Tiger, Wolf kind of goes into this quote about nothing was ever proved. Men debated and discussed these things a thousand times. And so I'm thinking about our readings on Tuesday where we read parts of Welcome to Our City and then we read parts of Miss Clark's The Road. And The Road is set in urban renewal. It's about the building of 240 and the destruction of, um, of the East End neighborhood. And so just thinking about Wolf and Child by Tiger and collective memory, like what he is trying to connect, to connect and, and like talk about as Asheville or Altamont as, as a whole, or the South as a whole. Uh, Catherine, I would go back to my, Kevin, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, um, or anybody else can. And this, this is just thinking it through. Um, Wolf was a deeply intellectual man. Um, you can see that in his work when you read it. 
And as I think about that, Catherine, I can't help but think about, again, I'll name John Hope Franklin here, one of his essays that he wrote in the 1960s, which was called The Loneliness of the Black Intellectual. And he places that in context of the intellectual in general in this country, where he says that those who give themselves over kind of to an intellectual life, this is John Franklin, really exist in a world of loneliness in the broader context of what America is, of what it has become, which I think is kind of sad. I, you know, I talked to Deborah briefly after, after uh, my remarks, and she said, you got Alexis de Tocqueville in. <laughs> and I mean, you know, right now as a department, the we're, Dr. Waters yeah, card here. Yeah, yes, <laughs> we, we are in the process of doing planning for America 250, for the 250th anniversary of the founding of this country, the American Revolution. What is that going to look like? And I've been telling people that I'm more interested in the 200th anniversary of Alexis de Tocqueville's time in the United States, 50 years after the, the revolution was over. And I'm hoping that we're gonna do something around that to think about what Tocqueville says in Democracy in America. And as I read Democracy in America, and especially the translation that I have, and that the introduction to it that Tocqueville is basically saying, we need to study democracy because it is the wave of the future. Monarchies are, are crashing, aristocracies are falling, they will be replaced by democracies. And what better place to go to study it than to go to the United States, this young country that builds itself as a democracy. I believe his conclusion at the end of the day was to say that while democracy seems vibrant in the United States, it's not the form of democracy that the rest of the world needs. And he's arguing that it's so heavily tinged by what I try to say is a radical form of capitalism that there is this forgetting, you know, of the project itself. Uh, Catherine knows that I would ask students in class, does America have a purpose? Does it have a mission? And very few students were willing to answer that question. Because they didn't know. You know, here we are about to celebrate America 250. You know, what, what is this project? Tocqueville goes on to say that there's this great forgetting that is occurring. Forget, because in this, uh, he, you know, I don't have the quote in front of me of what he says, but that uh, in the continued movement that agitates a democratic country, he says there is a forgetting of the ideals of your forefathers and there's no effort to take care of them because we're just getting things. It's about getting things as much as we can. So the Americans seem to be so obsessed with that, that they feel that even in the getting that they will not live long enough to enjoy it. This is what he says about us. And I will argue that W.E.B. Du Bois was equally concerned because my reading of Du Bois's souls of black folks, and especially the chapter of the quest for the golden fleece, is that he's arguing what will happen to these people, to my people who have experienced America in a very different way that gives its soul, gives it a soul, the project, what happens once they are able to engage in this capitalist enterprise? I believe that's what he's arguing. And he's concerned about that, what that means. So I'll bring Wolf back and say, you know, to say it with John Franklin and in this essay on the loneliness of the black intellectual, it's a lonely space to be in because you're the ones who are thinking, you're thinking through these things in a larger sense. You open the very first chapter of the second volume of Democracy in America and Tocqueville says that I have found no other country in the world that is that pays less attention to philosophy than America. Mm -hmm. There's a, a philosophy that moves them, but they have no idea of what it is. They don't think about it. Therefore, the intellectuals live, exist in this space, and they're trying to make an argument to people. This is the reason why I say the humanities are so fundamentally important to the educational enterprise. The argument that we don't, the humanities are not important, come on. I mean, it's about what makes us human. Right? It's not about the just getting of things. And I think that in a way that, that Wolf was in that, for me, this writing that he's doing, and just read, just read the last chapter of, of Time and River when he's saying, I have a thing to tell you. He critiques American capitalism in that last part. And it is not, 
what I would say a uh, it's a devastating critique. Mm. And this is what driving. So I think in a way, Catherine, I will answer your question that way. That he's saying, yeah, we're, we'll debate it, but then, but at the end of the day, we're going to forget the debating and the thinking about these intellectual things and what really is it that makes life human because we're going to go back to the almighty dollar. Yeah. That's so interesting because in Welcome to Our City, one of the, the random themes that I think he just wanted to squeeze in there because he's Wolf and he has a lot to say <laughs> was, you know, there's this discussion with the, uh, the government character and there's a lot that they talk about back and forth about um, the sort of uh, destruction or, or uh, very intentional picking apart of the state university system. And so already at 22, 23 years old, having just graduated from UNC Chapel Hill, he's seeing that they're trying to, um, to mess with the liberal arts and to destroy the liberal arts because they're getting a little out of hand. So I think that's, that's an interesting thought too. Kevin, did you have something else to say or something? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Just, um, Building off on actually the point you had made, that it was what had struck me in Welcome to the City as well. Um, in the past, I admit I had never actually read all the way through Welcome to Our City because it's what is usually stigmatized because it does, it had its origins, you know, with Wolf using the uh, racial epithet for the black neighborhood uh, as the title of the play. Uh, it's, you know, generally considered to be one of both, you know, what adolescent works, he, he was so young, and it's just a mess. So all I had ever done previously is I you know, looked through the play and I had taken these uh, stage directions that he gives, which, which give a really interesting perspective on a white outsider's view of the black neighborhood in downtown Nashville. Because here he is, a white outsider, and he's looking and he's seeing things He's an outsider, but it's interesting because you get very few descriptions like that anywhere else. So it's not, you know, it's a unique source. But what struck me when I was reading it, that made my jaw drop, is the relevance of not the racial per se issues that he discussed, discusses in a play, but university systems. Like when he talks about the school of business, why we require our students to have one credit hour of fine arts, because it's good for relaxation. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, you know, I thought it like the whole, I thought the whole, you know, mushrooming of business schools and the, the hostility toward humanities departments, I thought that that was relatively new, but this is over a century ago. That's incredible. I, that's why I fell in love with Welcome to Our City. I first read it while I was working on my master's and I, was, wait, hold on, is this the news or is this Wolf a hundred years ago? Because it, it is so deeply relatable and he does such a fantastic job of pulling on so that that, uh, that silly satirical booster language. I, for those of you who are Facebook friends with me, I, I put up a, uh, a quote from the Nashville City Directory in the 1880s versus a quote from Wolf and asked who was who. And it mm -hmm. turns out that the more loquacious of the two is actually the city directory. <laughs> so somehow in trying to, uh, so questions in the audience, I want to engage you all. Yes. Um, yeah, I would like to raise this question with anyone who's interested in Thomas Wolf and Child by Tiger. I think that too many people have accepted the news stories that were reported and Terrell's account of, the, of what happened. Because I was able to find a record of Will Harris, born to Will and Paula Harris, in the 1890 uh, census of Asheville. Will Harris grew up and he worked for a, a, a very wealthy family as a butler in about the age of 17. In a house, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to notice with me, in a house that's now where the school is on Merriman, he mustered into the army, was reported to the Citizen Times in 1899. He served two, two, two services in the army and mustered out in California in 1905. He served in the Philippines. I mean, this is all public record that I followed. When Will Harris came back here, he lived with the Flack family. Uh, Will Flack was the girlfriend, supposedly. He lived with the Flack family and on the east side. When they sold that house, they moved to a new house that's where the current county jail is. Um, 
But they, the family moved it. He didn't. He moved in where he was a driver next door to the old Kentucky home. I found the name of the family by a black driver living next door to the old Kentucky home. So Will Harris knew the driver that lived next door. When they talked about throwing a football with the driver who lived next door, that was his life experience. Now, how he happened to fictionalize it and everything, fine. I mean, and your other history. But one of the things that calls to question is, yeah, Will Harris was notorious across the South. I found records of him being arrested in multiple states all over the South. Maybe they were using the name. Maybe it was a common name. But Will Harris, who died here, was born here, lived here, worked here, and enrolled in the Army from here, and came back here after he served. I am absolutely positive I'd be happy to provide you with the historical details. Anyway, I just think that needs to be corrected. I really do. Thank you for sharing that. We're all about a good vertical file in uh, special collections. So if you'd like to bring your research, that's and... where I can't got a lot of information. <laughs> Great, <laughs> perfect. Yes, we're doing our job, <laughs> setting the record straight. Um, and I think that's what's so wonderful about. I've been talking quite a bit about uh, revisionism versus negationism mm -hmm. recently, and uh, <laughs> how uh, how what historians like our job is revisionism. That's what we do. Um, so to, to, to talk poorly about revisionism um, is, is kind of odd. Did you have a response I, for that? I do, I do have to say you bring up the issue of revisionism, uh, Catherine, and I have to make this comment. It's like, you know, uh, Eric Foner, you know, the great historian, um, written about Reconstruction, and this story is out there. We, you know, he got into this back and forth, I guess, back in the 1990s about revisionist history and debating none other than um, the former vice president's wife, uh, Lynn Cheney, on this whole issue of revisionism. And then he was called by a reporter to ask him about this whole idea of revisionist history. Where does that start? Where did that begin was the question that came to him. And he said, probably began with Herodotus. <laughs> and then the reporter, the reporter says, oh, can you give me his number? <laughs> wow. So this is where we are. You know. Yeah, and I would just say, like, I would, I would love to see documentation on it, because I, I think that's fascinating. And if you have, have the records for it, that's awesome. Um, I'll provide it to you. I'll pull up and I'll find a way to connect with you then. Others? Yeah. So I will say that earlier when you first started speaking, you said somebody told you when you were doing your work, presenting your dissertation, saying, oh, well, nobody reads Thomas Wolfe anymore. So I'm a teacher in Buckingham County, and about a decade ago, I decided to teach child Hammer at the high school, and it was one of the great Tango Thomas Wolf Memorial, like the, uh, it was deep, just in short. And this is why we kind of started doing research, because the, it, the students' reaction to this short story was so huge that I couldn't shake it. I was like, what's going on here? Like, this is very exciting. And um, what is it in this story that made the whole room just like different, change, alter? And then when we did the field trips and things, it was fantastic. And absolutely, how can we not be teaching Thomas Wolfe here? <laughs> you know? So that, but when we've been looking for information and trying to unpack some of the story, um, inspired by a teenage reaction to this short story, this has been several years of like examining, inspired by kids reading the story and having a reaction. So one of my questions is, because we've often thought, like, where's the black telling? Where are the black newspapers? Because we found terrific Chicago newspapers. Where is the black story being told, like, in the days after? Where are all those newspapers? Like, that, I'm, not, I'm not a historian, per se, so I, maybe there's an, an easy answer to that, but it's like, so hard to find. Yeah, unfortunately, there's not. Um, there was a, a paper, uh, the, the Colored Enterprise was the name of the paper, being published in Asheville during that time. And unfortunately, we only have 
one copy of one volume of it. It was in the that was in the, yeah. the Vance monument, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, the paper ran up until 1910. In fact, the publisher of the paper is a character. At least I think he is a character in Welcome to Our City. Um, he's he's positioned as like a a, a Yankee agitator, um, as someone who is who was born a free black man who has been to college and is, is riling up discontent in the Easton neighborhood. But I wonder, other papers? I mean, there's really, we, we, I'm not sure, we're not sure what happened to the Colored Enterprise. It's kind of odd. Um, I know that the paper in Wilmington yeah. was burned as part of the coup. I, there's nothing that we can point to here in Asheville that says this was where the clear destruction of these papers are, but I don't know if either of you all know. I, I don't know. That is a good question. I um, know that I, I can't remember the name of the paper. It's escaping me right now, but the black newspaper that was published yeah. out of Livingston, out in Salisbury, North Carolina. Um, and I, you know, I haven't dug deep, deep as Kevin has done into the Will Harris story. Um, I ended up stopping my dissertation at 1901 and not taking it up to 1906 because I just had to stop somewhere and I got it. And then I had professor saying, okay, so either you get it done or you just don't know. <laughs> so, um, but one of the challenges, I think, I mean, it's ancestry, I think now newspapers.com has tried to digitize a lot of the African-American newspapers that are available, but there are a lot that are not. Um, and there may be some, but this is one of the things that we've kind of tried to take on uh, since I've come into my role, that a lot of the archives um, for historically black colleges and universities have not been given the resources that they need to really be and Anita may be able to speak to this as well. This, they're challenged with how those archives have been maintained. When I was doing my research, I was never able to get access to Shaw University's uh, archive because there was never anyone there and it was, not, um, it was not available. I tried to do the same thing at Livingston University College um, down in uh, Salisbury and never could get access because their former president at Livingston College, William Trent, was the head of the YMI at the time that the Will Harris episode took place here in Milk. He became president of Livingston. Now his, his uh, William Trent's great, I think his great granddaughter has written a biography of him, but he's one of those people who are a part of that group who passes that resolution um, in Asheville uh, at the time that this actually happened but I never could get access to the records down at Livingston College. And I've had a conversation with the former president of St. Augustine University, um, Dr. Everett Ward, who I was with just last week. And he said, you know, let, we need to make this an initiative to use, to try to use some of the state's resources to help historically black colleges and universities get these archives together in a way that will, will make them available to future scholars. So that, you know, it's one of the things that we're trying to take on. So there may be more evidence and more uh, resources from which we can draw. But right now, I don't know where those, I don't know what, where they are. are uh, Didn't you all put a call out for photos and stories to be? Yeah, so, and, and Dr. Waters' response in this question was gonna lead me toward, you know, this a question about accessibility. Mm -hmm. So in recently, in, in talking about revisionism and, um, I've been using Dr. Insko as an example because my research kind of follows in his, you know, Mountain Master's footsteps and trying to learn a little bit more about slavery here. And I say that, you know, Dr. Insko literally could not have done the research that I am able to do now when it comes especially to newspapers. Dr. Insko would have had to sit with a reel of microfilm and read every single line of every single page of the newspaper, whereas when I'm doing slavery research, I sit down at newspapers.com, I can type in whatever term and look through thousands and thousands and thousands and come across things that 
he just literally did not have the time for. And so this idea about where are these black newspapers and they might be hiding somewhere in an HBCU archive or in folks' homes, um, you know, that is a huge part of what we try to do and make sure that we can reach out to folks and help facilitate any kind of, of archiving, whether that's digitizing something and letting folks keep their original treasures or acting as custodians or working together with neighborhood associations and other community groups to facilitate their own community archiving. So that, you know, if there's, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, if there is a letter in an archives and it has not yet been described, does it even really exist? And so for us as researchers, again, no, it, it doesn't. It's somewhere out there. So, you know, I um, I won't make you answer a question about Biltmore accessibility, but I, 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 <laughs> um, I, I won't put you in that hot seat, but I think about all the time how, you know, they are, it is a private family archives. Um, but I think about how the entire history of, you know, at least the early history of the Shiloh community is boxed up in there somewhere, um, and the hundreds and hundreds of hours of oral histories that are in there that folks will probably never get to hear. But, you know, making sure that we holler about how important it is to make sure that these items are accessible and to make them as digitally accessible as possible. So, at least for us at Buncombe County Special Collections, and I know our colleagues around the region are really focused on um, diversifying our archives and elevating that. Um, our policy right now is that at least 25% of everything that we collect in any given year is, uh, is related to, in some way or another, a historically marginalized group. Um, so whether that is uh, black folks, Hispanic folks, LGBTQ folks, and women, working class also falls under there because so much of what our archives are very mm -hmm. focused on wealthy people. Mm -hmm. um, but it certainly is something that I'm sure it, it bugs all of us. Like, where are these things? It, it seems hard to believe to me that there is no better record of the colored enterprise mm -hmm. just because of how the publisher, Thomas Leatherwood, was a, a very well-known man. He was very well established. This paper was received all over the western part of the state, but we really just don't have anything. But uh, Emily pointed out that um, <laughs> that you can kind of get gleanings from the Colored Enterprise through a, um, a, a column that was in the Asheville Citizen called the Tattler, and it's a, a response column. So, so you can kind of get a, an idea of what uh, Leatherwood and the other reporters who are working for the Colored Enterprise are talking about based on the reactions of the um, the conservative newspaper at that time. I, you know, I just to add maybe to piggyback off of what she's saying, Kevin, you may want to jump in here. It's, you know, there's issues of trust um, that exist that you have to work with. Um, I mean, we, whether we like it or not, we are becoming a much more diverse nation, state, community. That just, it's just, you know, you don't want to tell people to get over it, right? Except that this is who we're becoming. Um, and you need diversity at the table, right? You, even in the collecting, people who have been experienced that marginalization over years are very distrusting. You know, it took a lot for me to get my mother to agree to allow her father's photographs to be digitized. It took a lot to get her there. And, and even now, there will be occasions when she will say to me, even though they were digitized, she got the originals back, she will say, she will say if I had known you weren't gonna be here, I would have never done that. Because there's just this, how is this going to be used? I, in the middle of the night, one night, I. My mom called and don't tell her this that I didn't answer the phone because I was thinking to myself, you know, if she's calling me this late, there's an issue. And either please don't tell her I said this. So I, I need to know his mom really well. And so it's about ten thirty and I saw I was like, okay, there's there's gotta be an issue. And I just and I just didn't answer the phone. I said, I'll talk to her in the morning. If the, if it's an emergency, she'll call back. Well the emergency was shortly after the phone call. I went on my phone and was looking at Facebook and in this archive called the Black Archive, 
images of her father's pictures, my grandfather's pictures were popping up. And so, but he was acknowledged as the photographer. And so she was calling about that. So the next morning she's like, I saw these pictures. She said, what's going on? I'm like, mom, that's what we want people to do. And I talked to Gene Hyde about this and I called Gene. I said, Gene, did anybody get permission to use this? He said, they did. And he said, Darren, and the great thing about it is that people are, it's like you're doing um, crowdsourcing. He said, we don't know the names of many of the people in these photos, mm -hmm. but he said, if you look at the thread on Facebook, people are saying, that's my uncle, that's this person. So they're identifying people. But I just tell that story, say mom still experiences that anxiety about having given her stuff over. And we, yeah, I find this all the time with people. They don't, what's going to be done with our information? How is it going to be used? Or will it be suppressed? I mean, every single day that I go to my job, I can't help but think about John Hope Franklin. And, anyway, you know, John Hope Franklin, the, the father of African American history is Carter G. Woodson. Carter G. Woodson was John Hope Franklin's mentor. John Hope Franklin was my mentor. I'm not far removed from Carter G. Woodson. And it's, you know, when you think about it in that context, it's amazing to think about that. And Woodson was told in 1916, when he started the, the, uh, the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, when he was working on this, that blacks have no history worth studying. This is what he's told. No one wanted to give him money to support it. He did this with his own resources, his own money, really at the very beginning stages of it. No other journal, no other academic journal, especially in the histor historical side in history, would publish black scholars, black historians, other than the Journal of Negro History published by the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. John O. Franklin, W.E.B. Du Bois couldn't get his book reviewed in the major history journals, nor speak at the major history conferences. It would be John O. Franklin would be the first person to break that. Now, John O. Franklin, I encourage everybody to read his autobiography, Mirror to America, where he charts out these stories. I have the distinction of being John O. Franklin's last student um, to guide me through my work. I mean, he was 92 years old when he was doing it. It was an amazing experience to have. But John O. Franklin, when he comes to North Carolina in 1938, in the late 1930s, to do his research for his dissertation, which was titled, his book titled, The Free Negro in North Carolina, to look at the experiences of free blacks in this state prior to the Civil War. He walks into the archives, not in the same building that we're in now, but that building still stands in Raleigh. He comes in, one of my predecessors tells him, when he walks in, he tells him I'm here to do research on, uh, for my dissertation and tells him what it's about. He's then told, we weren't set up to serve people like we're sorry. And Dr. Crittenden, my predecessor, did say, it's not that I don't believe you should have access, but our policies don't allow you to have access. So Don Hope Franklin said he stood there defiantly, saying, you're going to do something. I'm here to do this research. And if you knew John Franklin, you knew he was anything. He was defiant. He could be that, but in a very nice way. You know, he did, he did it in a very nice way. But he said he stood there and uh, Dr. Prittenden then told him, he said, well, let's see what we can work out, if we can work something out here. And we'll give us a couple of weeks. He said, well, I don't have a couple of weeks. I'm here from Boston, now from Cambridge, from Harvard to do this research. You've got to do something to do it quickly. He said two days later, they called him back and they tell him, we'll come back. We think we've figured something out. Comes back over to the archives. He goes in and they tell him, well, first, first, no one behind the counter can serve you. If you've been to the archives, you come down, you know, you write down on a slip of paper what you want, and then the people who work there will go back behind this door and they get the material and bring it back out to you. I mean, I watched this as I was doing my research. I always wanted to know what is behind that door. <laughs> so when I took the job, the very first thing I did ask the state archivist, who my office oversees all of this. I said, Sarah, I know this is going to sound childish, but I want to go back there. <laughs> but he's told, no one can serve you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you your own key to the stacks you have to serve yourself. <laughs> Every researcher's dream. <laughs> I don't know about you. Give me that access, right? 
Then they tell him, second thing, you cannot sit in a research room with everybody else. We have to segregate you out so we can give you our own office. Also, <laughs> so he says that it only took two days before everybody started complaining that he was getting special treatment. <laughs> that is the ultimate malicious compliance. Yeah. So it's like every day when I go into the office, I can't help but think about him because I think about the fact that while he was denied access and they had to figure out a way to do it, me as his last student, I now oversee all of it. And it's my job to ensure that people have the access. And it is, and I, you know, fortunately I'm serving under an administration, especially a secretary in Reed Wilson, who is absolutely and totally committed to ensuring that people have access to these records. So that we can tell, as he says, I told him he's not going to need me soon because he becomes such a good historian in such a very short time. He said, we need to tell it all. We need to tell the complexity of the American story. And that means telling the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. And so, it, but the access is important and ensuring that you have the people at the table. I, um, I was, one more thing, Catherine, I'll say that. It's interesting to be in a position that I'm in. Deborah, Deborah Miles and I talked about this a lot before when I stood as a candidate for this job. I mean, there were major, major questions because in my role as Deputy Secretary, I am the state's historian. And I wondered if the state of North Carolina would be bold enough to make this move. First African American served in this role. Deborah and I talked about it. I was very skeptical as to whether or not this would, I would be successful as a candidate. I'm proud of the state that the state made that decision. Shortly after taking the role, I had to meet with my counterparts in the other 50 states. They meet annually in a group which they need to change the name of the group. Everything is acronym, but the name of the group is SHAM. <laughs> yes, State Historic Administrators Meetings. I gotta come up with a different name. I don't want people to think that what we're offering people is a sham. But so much of it, as you know, has, has been because of not allowing people access and not being our suppressing uh, documentation our, and resources. But to show up at the meeting with all of my other counterparts from across the country and to see that there is absolutely no diversity in that room. No. Only your state, the state of North Carolina, has a diverse person at the table. Everybody is sitting there talking about America 250 and we need to be telling the diverse stories and but there's no one they're talking about it theoretically but they can't think about it in a very practical way because there is no diverse voice at the table representing the interest of these states. We need to radically change that to get people this is the results. Humanities are important. There are opportunities for people who study history, who study archaeology, especially on the public history side. There are things that you can do with that degree. Those degrees remain important. And if we're going to tell a different story and we're going to reshape the narrative to be, to be more realistic and in keeping with what the experience has been, we've got to ensure that we have more people from mar traditionally marginalized communities participating in this process. I'm sorry, I got on soon. She's great. We've got time for one more quick one. Emily. Um, going back to Chaba Tiger. So when um, when Dick Foster, after he kills the police officer, and he is leaving the house and then going down the street and killing more people, um, Wolf is very descriptive about like a street by street like route that he takes and I thought it was like an interesting choice because he could have conveyed what was happening without describing the streets and stuff. And so I was wondering what you might, why you think you might have chosen to why so fixate on the geography, or is it a literary device, or or both? Um, and what about the um, location of the the black community and the shape of it is so significant for him? One thing that really struck me in his description of Will Harris's route and the, the shootings is that Wolf specifically names every white 
victim. And every white person who has been wounded and every white person we've seen, none of the dead African Americans are mentioned by name. It's all a generic elderly Negro man, whatever. But there are no names associated with the other black residents of the neighborhood. It's only white residents that get named. And I, I found that really interesting when I was reading the story. It really, really stood out to me that you know, Wolf can be very sympathetic to the one man, but the black community as a whole is this undifferentiated mass without individual characters. Uh, in terms of the actual geography of the neighborhood, I think in, in part it is because Wolf has that personal connection and it is fascinating for him historically that I mean, he was a, apparently would, a newspaper delivery boy in the neighborhood. He was walking those streets on a daily basis. He knew when he was writing it, he, he could easily visualize every step of the way. And so I think that there was that personal attraction as well. Uh, I, I could add this. Pearl Flack lived with the Flack family in a house where the county courthouse or the county jail is now. Um, Pearl Fleck was supposedly um, in some relationship with him. If, if that whole thing transpired there, that's at the head of uh, the street, and if you go from there ge geographically, it's right down Eagle Street to, to downtown. I mean, it, you don't have to make up, you know, that, that is exactly where everything happened. And Wolf does a really good job of like describing that area and welcome to our city too. And I think it's like what, what Dr. Young said is that he had that paper route and like could yeah. just he I knew like, it. I, when I'm reading it, I'm like hoping you've like been through this area for over 20 years now. Like it feels relevant to me, you know, because I can visualize it. I've been there, I know what it looks like. But like it is not really relevant to somebody who's never been here, you know, and the and his audience much broader than this town and I'm wondering why he is so why he chooses to be so big say on something that most people can't relate to you know I think that's a really yeah. wonderful statement to close out on it's wolf <laughs> and when I can't answer that question he's very descriptive I agree with Kevin that um, you know he looks at the African American community at least in in the child by tiger as this kind of collective mass and he doesn't differentiate people but you get something very different in uh, Welcome to Our City, where he is describing characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's very, he, he to me, when I read uh, Welcome to Our City, it was after having read, reread uh, Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man and the description, how descriptive yeah. Ralph, Ralph Ellison is in The Invisible Man. Yeah. It, I was like, you know, is he, What's going on here? So, you know, is there a borrowing, more borrowing here? Because he's very descriptive about characters and these different characters that make up the African American community. The one who comes from the outsider, who's described from being from New York, who is, Boston. yeah, from, Boston. he's very, you know, militant. He's got that kind of, he would, a black nationalism. And he's, he's able to, Wolf is able to capture that nationalism in a way that, you know, was striking to me. Would you find that surprising? It, it just stuck out to me. But he also describes this guy as fair-skinned, you know, which it gets into all that is going on around the whole issues of social Darwinism at the time. And the arguments that are being made about those who are mulattoes and that they are these, this is the group that is much more aggressive and agitative about these things because of the mixture of the white blood. So he's probably thinking it when, as he's playing with that because you will know that the one character in the African American community who's, who's presented as passive is described as a much more darker complected person who's a southerner. It, he, so Wolf is playing with some of these, are, is at least treating them in his work. And that just, it makes me, it, it's just intriguing to me to think that at that time he's doing, I don't know if any other white author who's doing it that way at that time, I don't know, but he's at least exploring things that it seems to me, I don't know that other people were exploring at the time. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I mean, I guess, I think like in comparison with like just in general, being a low diversity academic might kind of relevant to the description of the crosser like group because it's so much about the location and the length of the streets and like the, the where, where it is in relation to the river, right? Because it's mostly downtown and like, you know, I just like, I wonder what issue he is working out in himself about like, by ownership of his city, you know? Emily, and Emily, I'll point this out too, that around the turn of the century too, later on, he may have been familiar with William Hannibal Thomas. That's another figure who's an African-American who writes a, writes a book about the American Negro, which is a just essentially a, you, you know, how, how would it, it um, one of my former professors have written a biography of William Hannibal Thomas, uh, John David Smith, and I would recommend um, Black Judas is the name of the book. And Hannibal Thomas is, you know, playing right in the hands of uh, white conservatives uh, at the time of saying, yeah, your, your attitudes about, about black people are true. And, and so this book has been written and made me think as Wolf, as I see Wolf play with these characters and the descriptions that he's given them, he may have been referencing uh, William Hannibal Thomas's work to be able to describe him in the way that he does these characters. So it's, just, it's an interesting time, um, I, you know, the early 1900s of, of what is really going on and is happening. And you, you've just got so much going on. You know, you've got uh, uh, Ida B. Wells who is out there, you know, who's doing all so these the got to place it in the context of all of those things that are yeah. that are happening. This can't really make sense. I mean, you got me kind of going. Here. <laughs> well, I know. I was like, it's, it's, this is hard. It's hard to moderate yeah. conversations in a room full of history nerds. Um, but we've got uh, 30 minutes left while the library is still open, so I'm going to have to cut off conversation for now. But I encourage you all to mill about, okay. drink some more coffee, get some cookies. Uh, please take a look at the back table. We've got uh, some events coming up and we'd love for you to take our events survey so we can hear more about from you all what you'd like to hear from us so thank you all so much again have a wonderful evening